on the moon.
Get elite real-world performance for your desktop PC with 10th Gen Intel Core processors. If you're looking to game, create, live stream, or stay productive, 10th Gen Intel Core processors deliver an optimal balance of frequency, cores, and threads to handle real-world usages. Get enthusiast-level performance with an Intel Core i9 processor, up to 5.3 GHz clock speed for peak gaming performance and content creation workloads. Or for competitive gameplay and content creation, choose an Intel Core i7 with up to 5.1 GHz clock speed to handle your demanding applications. The Intel Core i5 processor with up to 4.8 GHz gives you a seamless AAA gaming and entertainment experience. And with up to 4.6 GHz clock speed, the Intel Core i3 is a great fit for everyday tasks and productivity. If you're looking to push your system even further, get additional performance headroom with unlocked 10th gen Intel Core processors, supported by Intel's advanced overclocking controls. Bring elite, real-world performance to your desktop PC with 10th gen Intel Core processors. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to week six of regular season of Women's League. My name is the Russian Cthulhu. I'm joined once again by a wonderful Pi. Pi, how are you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm actually really good, thanks. Um, yeah, I had a really hectic week where I did my finals and I actually finished my first, uh, my last hey. exam today. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a good time then to celebrate with some more wonderful matches of <laughs> Women's League tonight. But before we get into all those matches, quick reminder that we do have a uh, quick message from our sponsors as well. That is ZQ Racing, as they are going uh, doing another um, MVP award for this season as well. It's V6 uh, Racer Gaming Chair. It will be uh, uh, awarded to the MVP of uh, this season and will be decided at the end of um, at the conclusion of the grand final. So. Do stay tuned for that as uh, one of our wonderful ladies who are playing in the tournament will be awarded with that wonderful chair. But look, for us, we have a pretty interesting set of games tonight. Quite curious to see what shall be done here and what kind of school lines can be achieved. Last week was very, um, how should I say it, probably <laughs> one-sided would be the best way to really describe it as uh, we've seen some very... Uh, very dominant score lines. I believe Nocturnal and Elevate did manage to actually give themselves seven nils, and I believe it was Shadownet against Seventy First that ended up getting a seven seven zero. I think or seven one was it? I think it was a seven one. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. um, it, the whole list would have actually been four seven zeros. So unfortunately, that wasn't the case. But it was still <laughs> a, a quite a one sided day to cast. Yeah. Yeah, fa fairly fairly dominant games, and unfortunately for Barry's Bees or Nutty Gaming or King's Women, um, they couldn't really do much there. But let's have a look at the matches that we are going to be seeing tonight and take a look at our wonderful schedule. So the first match that we are going to be seeing is King's Women versus Barry's Bees. Offstream, the Musketeers, aka X Nutty Gaming, will be uh, playing it out against Elevate Offstream, and then the second, or rather, well, match three. And the second broadcasted match is going to be Nocturnal versus Shadownet, which I feel could be a banger, but uh, we'll get to that after the matchup number one. But let's take a look closer at King's Women versus Barry's Bees, because this is a matchup uh, between the two teams that are currently residing just outside of the top four positions, and uh, certainly both of those rosters had a bit of a, of a, a rough season, to say at the very least. Yeah, I think both teams have started off maybe a little weaker than what they would have preferred. But as hmm. it is, you know, today we're having both of them match, off against, match up against each other, which should show some interesting results. And it should, you know, help cl clarify the scoreboard and really see which team is you know, more capable than the other. Yeah, definitely. Let's have a look also at the rosters of our wonderful teams tonight as well. First up comes around is oh no, that's nocturnal. That's 
slightly different one that we'll uh, be looking at a little bit <laughs> later. Uh, but look, King's Women, yeah, will definitely have a chance to really redeem themselves here because they're currently sitting at the bottom of the leaderboard, unfortunately, in a tiebreaker against themselves and Musketeers. Whereas Barry's Bees have a, um, a single win to them name, which does put them right above uh, the two bottom teams on the leaderboard, and uh, certainly, well, at least statistically, they have the advantage. Looking at the roster as well, there we go, it's Corvice, Angry Wolf, Bruneck, Bernabe, and Mardina that will be coming around and playing tonight. Any kind of thoughts on this roster, Pai? Yeah, well, I think with Kingswoman, you know, they definitely, even though they haven't performed as well this season, their organization as a whole is still quite capable, as from the results that we were shown in Season 2, where they still managed to place within the top three. Um, so it's it'll be interesting to see if maybe they're just taking a little bit of time to get accustomed to this new pace of the tournament, or maybe they're just getting accustomed to their new teammates because there has been a little bit of a roster shuffle. So it'd be mm. good to see, you know, this far into the round robin at least, to see them settling down and to see maybe some positive results coming out. Yeah, well, hopefully for them they will be able to um, get things going for themselves. But have a look. let's have a look at the year challengers. That is going to be Barry's Bees coming right up. And uh, we have quite a fair few uh, noteworthy names, a few um, returns from Season 2 like we did talk previously uh, would you be able to run us through that roster as well? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so they have Gorn Walkabouts as their team captain, Small Chazza, Hotto, Death Snotel, Heart Explodes, Weird One, the Downfall here as their sub, and Striner as their team coach. Yeah, so that roster definitely has seen a fair few, uh, well, just about close performances for some of the mm. rounds, some of the games. Unfortunately, all they could really muster up was a single win, but that does keep them out of the uh, the bottom two positions. So that is already, um, I would say, um, I would think as as a dub. But maybe here this is going to be a chance for them to really find themselves yet another win, possibly. Now, before we get to the game at hand, the one more thing remaining to look at is going to be the map bans and vetoes, as we are going to be seeing as to where we are going to be playing it out, and well, it is going to be Clubhouse that will be brought on board. Nothing too surprising, Clubhouse is one of those maps that is uh, fairly frequently picked. It's a comfort ground for quite a whole lot of teams, it seems. Uh, main thing, we, we have been kind of d discussing that prior to the broadcast as to how close could the game be here, rather, and uh, uh, maybe this could be fairly one-sided, but... Um, Personally, for me, I, I reckon we might actually um, see a fairly close one. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. You know, we were talking about this before the stream, like how, how exactly how close these games will be. And I briefly mentioned that I believe whichever team actually will be starting out on defense should have a marginal advantage. And it will actually be Kingsman starting out on defense. So, uh, you know, just tossing this idea out there. I think maybe Kingsman will be taking the first few rounds, you know, getting that setting that pace for the game so that the rest of the time they should have a little bit of a comfortable advantage at least. However, I think if Kingswomen don't manage to pull out that early lead, then things could be looking a little rough for them, especially after the round swap and they go on attack. Things will mm. definitely go in the favor of Barry's Bees, in my opinion, so can only wait to see. All right, so could be possibly just the, the game of who can muster up a little bit more rounds in the defense, I suppose. Well... Let's have a quick look at the clubhouse before we actually transition ourselves over into the game. It is going to be King's Women versus Barry's Bees. Barry's Bees are going to be the ones to attack, like we said. And, uh, well, let's get straight right into it. Because, um, definitely, this uh, very matchup could, very, uh, could change up the bottom uh, set of teams at the leaderboard. And, oh, hello, map stats. No, be gone. Family show. Thank you. Go on walkabout. Keeping it real. <laughs> Keeping it real indeed. Well, first ban coming around. I'm expecting that we might see at least semi-serious bans here from both of the teams, although I don't think there's going to be uh, also like a fully serious ban set. 
yeah, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see a Thatcher and Maverick ban come up first. And speaking of which, it is going to be that Maverick ban, which does make sense, especially if you are going to be the team starting out on defense. You definitely don't want to be dealing with that hard breacher, especially seeing as he does have frag grenades. Second ban coming out from Barry's Bees is going to be Thatcher as well. No real surprise there. His uh, EMP grenades that are able to temporarily disable electronics are always a nuisance to deal with. So to get him out of the board is definitely a sensible choice. Most definitely. Now, well, my ban is definitely a thing that has been reoccurring quite recently uh, and quite frequently as well, mm. uh, given that um, having him on Clubhouse is definitely a huge advantage for the defense. And with him out of the equation, that does limit the defense to just a few ADSs, which somewhat reverts the effects of that 20 second meta, at least partially, I feel. Yeah, definitely. I, I think having that with my band does mean, you know, A, no magnets, B, no deployable shield, which means certain mm. really, uh, certain sites that you really want with my on, such as the cash and CCTV site where he's able to hold the garage rafters, which a lot of teams do utilize him for that purpose. It does mean that he won't be there and it does mean that you'll definitely need to take in a Jaeger, which I don't see right now. So I'm really hoping that Kingsman will take in a Jaeger because having a protection form against any form of projectile is going to be a huge advantage, especially considering that Hodo is on Sledge, which does mean that she has access to frag grenades. Yeah, the frag grenades are going to be a huge thing to really work around, but, well, would have <laughs> been a huge thing to work around. And talking about the ADSs, they're actually going to be making a reappearance. Um, so instead of the dual breach denial combo, we shall be seeing only a singular bandit, but... Um, look, that does definitely make Attack the defense a little bit more uh, workable <laughs> and a little bit more flexible with the the way how current uh, meta also looks. Whereas, yeah, on the side of attack, um, I don't think it is a bad decision to really change off from a uh, sledge to a capital, given that the capital would actually be pretty much a direct counter to to the bandit and the bandit <laughs> tricking. Uh, but certainly a set of frag grenades could have uh, done quite some good work as well. So it's a bit of a, I suppose, a coin toss here <laughs> as to what exactly do uh, the team, does the team want? So maybe this round will be our main answer here, as um, so far we're only just now seeing a few setups and only a single set of ADSs, which is definitely um, a little bit alarming, I have to say, because... Uh, well, one ADS does go into the red stairs, I'm assuming, yeah, the, and the third one does go into the window of CCTV, so... I suppose a few things is a good way about it, but, yeah, Bernabe already, I believe, losing... Oh, only a, si a single set of uh, the bandit batteries is not a bad thing at all. Yeah, not a bad thing at all. I, I definitely think that with only one set of ADSs per each key location, is going to be a little bit of a struggle for Kingsman if Barry's Bees, you know, so chooses to hard attack one area obviously if barry's bees doesn't quite have that communication down pat and they go for a very spread out attack from all directions possibly having those ads's in each position is going to be an advantage for this one as it is please don't bully me does manage to spot out the bandit trigger who is at the wall so she does know that there is someone waiting there which does mean that there has been no attempt yet on those cctv walls yeah well then instead there is going to be some pressure from up uh, below, from down below, but Hotto, that was a little bit of a panic, I feel, shot <laughs> with a fire arrow. And I definitely think that maybe her decision to use those fire arrows, say, on that very position where the bandit was, could have been much more, um, hmm. maybe the right way to call it, <laughs> much more, uh, impactful. Impactful, yeah, that that's thank you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the times you will see a capital standing on those suicide windows just so with that fiery capital bolt, you should be able to really flush out anyone who's standing directly on that wall. As it is, Small Chaser is going to be able to get those bandits, but Bernabé, who doesn't give up, still manages to get those bandit charges down through the nick of time, which does mean that this is going to prove a little bit annoying for various bees to really clear off. Yeah, please don't bully me is uh, sitting on the Bob final lance attacker. that she could use here. Certainly, so we'll be doing that very thing. So finally, the last bandit charge is gone, so the breach is going to be quite successful. But that did use quite a fair bit of uh, time as well as that. Oh, a little bit of uh, the nerves as well, because <laughs> Zabernabe nearly risked, uh, risked her life here right in front of that breach. 
But apart from that, with 40 seconds remaining, oh, that's a bean. That please don't bully me could have hit, but the last won't be just yet. Hotter does still have some smoke canisters available in her gadget, which does mean that if they choose to go for a smoke hat, that is entirely possible. However, I don't believe Corvus has used any of her smokes, and just as I'm saying, they're coming out and they're doing so much damage, but it doesn't matter because Corvus is going to get the first kill. Mardini is going to finish off with a second, and Vernabair clearing up Hotter. This is all of a sudden becoming a 20 second meta game again. Vernabair is going to drop the diffuser down onto the site, which does mean that the attackers won't have enough time and Bernabeu will be finishing off the last kill as well. Yeah, there we go. Very good hold by Kingswoman, gotta say, being able to just keep on playing around the fact that the the offense couldn't really coordinate well enough some of the pushes and couldn't really hold certain angles. So for Bernabeu, this was pretty much just free real estate to just keep on sitting around that reinforced wall and not really care much about well, any of the attempts at the breaching or being shot from below, because uh, for for her, it was pretty much an easy run and small chance couldn't really shut her down. Yeah, I think one of the downfalls to Barry's bees, especially in that first round, was just because they took far too long to really open up that CCTV war, you know, it, it, they had the right intention and they did actually manage to achieve the objective, but it took Attackers almost to two minutes of the round to bomb. get that done, so that by the time the CCTV walls were open by the time that you were setting up to go for a plant in that default site. It, there wasn't really a lot of opportunity because Corvai still had her smoke canisters. I would assume that there were still C4s in the pockets of the defenders as well. So to be able to burn through all of that utility as well in just one minute is quite a tall order unless you're going to be killing members of the defense team while you're at it. Yeah, the... C4 certainly could have been a huge addition there for some of the players to just even shut down even earlier. But yeah, look, I'm curious to see what will Barry's Bees be able to do it because uh, they're certainly changing things around a little bit more, bringing in even more of the um, hard breaching, fully realizing that they could possibly be shut down pretty quickly on some of those peaks. So having that abundance of hard breaching is certainly should be a good decision. Uh, but more so just comes the question, how well can they utilize it? If Bernabé knew how many people there <laughs> were right behind that doorway, that could have been a sick kill. But oh, sees the feet and well, that's already hot of, out of the equation. That is the ace, very, uh, a very impactful hard breacher that is now gone and out. Yeah, luckily for Barry's Beast, they did have him bring three hard breaches in. So, sure, losing an ace is the not the best option, but at least they still have two more hard breaches to work through. And they do know that there is going to be a roaming Jaeger out on the loose. So hopefully, you know, they have some drones set up to really watch that flank. Looks like they're going for a kitchen hatch tech. I don't really see any denial in place. However, Corvus is standing below with her impacts ready. She does, she has used two of her impacts already. Doesn't manage to quite get that trick off which does mean that Kitchen Hatch is going to be opened. Really big fucking right up. Yeah, well, meanwhile, already Bernabé has managed to actually walk around the whole of the, I suppose, the Rome holding, but Hard Explodes might be having a slight suspicion as to the general whereabouts. No, she's completely clueless about that, that flank. And, well, that's already another flank uh, flank kill by Bernabé onto Gorn Walkabouts. And, well, that is surely showing that the, the offense is all falling apart. Please don't bully me has been bullied into the injured state and it's all down to hard explodes and small chazza to really bring the situation back. Hard explodes should be able to get a relatively safe res onto please don't bully me. But meanwhile, as that is happening, Brunek is going to be taking down small chazza. I believe she was actually still close to the kitchen hatch, which does mean that the diffuser will be dropped quite a while away as well. Yeah, that is certainly going to be quite an issue, although still in the realm of being possible uh, to, be, uh, to be picked up, but surprisingly enough, Brunek could actually, well, if she had the C4, she could have set up a very nasty trap there, if she would have been aware, but drop down could be happening anytime soon here. It's Bernabé to pick up a frag from the ground floor once again. She's just absolutely nuts on that roam. And right now it's between her and Hard Explodes, and right now Hard Explodes is taking Attackers just a ton of damage. And, being unable to really return any damage back. 
Yeah, Hard Explosive is definitely in a very tricky scenario. She does still have three flash grenades ready in her arsenal. She, there's a multitude of angles that she needs to be aware of. She does make it onto site and she manages to put some shots into the defenders, but it doesn't matter because she ran out of bullets and it will be Corvice picking up that last kill, going for a flawless round at that as well. Kings women certainly asserting their dominance here, showing that they are most certainly ready to get themselves out of the bottom position on the leaderboard and this is their prime time it seems because right now yeah Barry's B is certainly looking a little bit unprepared for some of these plays some of these um, positions that are being held and certainly the fact that they weren't really able to deal with Bernabe's um, flank successfully certainly shows that uh, it might be an issue further down the line as well yeah, I feel like especially for a team on attack like that, especially on such a big map like Clubhouse where there are three stories and you're attacking the bottom level, you really need to be able to gain control of every other uh, story Attacking in the building before you can really collect can. yourself to go for that attack. Because if you don't, someone like Bernabe is just going to be roaming and is just going to slowly one by one pick up your team until you just don't have enough manpower to push through. Yeah, I mean, what Barry Bees did was initially put Small Chaza on um, the flank watch, which was around the bar area, but they were expecting Verna to just actually flat out up front, come around and, well, try to take that gunfight, which would have been a success for Barry Bees, but they didn't account for the fact that there was a flank from up top and, well, didn't really set up uh, neither any of the... Uh, um, claymores nor any drones and well pretty much got quite severely punished for that very decision but well that that round is pretty much already gone so we are going to be switching over to the gym bedroom now funnily enough actually king's women didn't really even bother to expand onto the cash room which is usually being used and instead put some heavy fortifications in the construction site with a rotation hole now question to you pi do you reckon this is a good setup for them, or do you reckon things could have been done differently? Okay. Well, I, I was actually just about okay. to mention that. I was just going to say uh, that position that Ingrid Wolf is in is quite risky, especially considering she doesn't actually have a mute jammer there to really deny any hard breaching. As it is, she is going to be forced hmm. out relatively quickly from that position. She does still have a deployable shield to play around, so I guess you know you could always reverse that angle of the deployable shield and play from cash. However, playing in cash is always going to be risky when none of the cash walls are actually reinforced. A lot of the times, as you were saying, you know, if you want an extended hold into that cash room, you would be reinforcing off those double cash walls as well as those top two red walls that you have. Once smoke does come out of Hotto, I believe they are trying to burn maybe some ADSs, maybe some uh, any utility off that wall, or to just open up the castle barricade. Really, just to provide any pressure onto Bernabeu at this point is just going to be a win. That spa wall is opened up, which does mean that they should have an angle of attack should Barry's Bees choose to go from that direction. At the moment, it looks like Barry's Bees are going into the right direction here just trying to go for some sort of a pincer move here with hard explodes already having at least at the moment the control of the logistics office she does not know about the whereabouts of angry wolf whereas angry wolf might have a, su a suspicion there but no okay hard explodes does manage to actually line up that oh shot so that is a good opening here yeah definitely gaining control of construction just like that is going to be a huge advantage and she does manage to get a couple of balcony cameras as well but it doesn't matter because Kingsman, and Runeck and Corvice are going to get their respective two frags. Mardina does get downed in the bathroom store, but that's no biggie because Bernabe is just going to pick her right back up. Yeah, already Corvice picking up a second kill and punishing the Thermite that decided to just jump straight into the gym. Will be punished straight away once again. It's down to a 2v1 situation. Small Chazza is still able to fend off some of the aggressors of the defense, but at the moment locked out pretty much out of the building and... Well, she has a breach to go go into, but the moment she will enter the building, pretty much she has to either contest against Brunek or Corvise, and both of them have their sights trained right onto that position. Well, that's around three taken by Kingswomen. 
Yeah, you know, I, I feel like the more that we watch these rounds, the more I can really identify an issue with Barry's Beast, which is, it isn't really their game plan, because it seems like their game plan is completely on track, you know, they're opening up the wars they should be opening up, it's really just their gadget utilization, as, uh, when I say gadget utilization, I not only mean their secondary gadgets, but also their droning. There felt like a lack of intel in that case, where the majority of the frags that did happen, was because you know their eyes locked on to the enemy and they won those gun trades but a lot of the times especially when you're facing off a team who is at the same level as you you don't want to be risking that because it's a 50 50 you know like what if you lose if you lose then you're dead and all your capability is zero so instead you know you stack a drone in so that you can get that intel so someone dead can be watching it or th there is just some Attackers form of to understanding towards bomb. what the setup and what the layout of kingsman is playing like because at this rate kingsman has a lot of intel we're constantly seeing a valkyrie pick we're constantly seeing a maestro pick and they're playing so coordinated and so tight knitted that anytime someone does die that information is acted upon whereas i don't see the same being replicated in barry's bees yeah, communication is certainly a huge thing here that needs to be emphasized quite severe, uh, quite heavily by um, Barry's Bees because I will 100% agree with you on the statement saying that they definitely need to just or use, a, use their information gathering utility a whole lot more frequently. And even then, um, the drone economy is a huge thing as well that not really frequently being talked about uh, given how powerful it can be, like you said, too find some information on the site and just figure out uh, even just find out the general whereabouts of some of the players so certainly you are not wrong on that one curious though how will this time barry's bees really act upon all of this because they did change things around a little bit they have the jackal this time to well maybe at the very least partially replace the info gathering uh that that was pretty much ignored by well with the drones and apart from that, really not a whole lot of changes. But well, maybe Chaz, the fact that Chaz actually swapped over from uh, the Zofia to a Nomad um, to also watch the flank is also a, somewhat of a decent adjustment, although not for this side. As I don't think last time we've seen King's Women defend this, uh, I don't think we've seen a whole lot of uh, um, a whole lot of Rome play. Really. Yeah, King's Women seems to Attackers play more close-knit, really, if there is any roam play normally, it is going to just be a solo roam, like when we seen Bernabé, when they were on that Church and Arsenal site, where Bernabé was just solo roaming mm. as Jaeger, so, I mean, taking a Jackal is never going to be a bad idea, because you don't know, as the attackers, you don't know if they are roaming, because they could be roaming, so to have those glasses on, to double check that no defender has actually walked past this is always going to be a little bit of a safety net and you know now that hard explodes does have those glasses on she does know that no one has actually really stepped into construction apart from reinforcing that trash wall life ping is going to be coming out on the valkyrie which i believe is playing on those garage rafters yes that mark won't be lasting long because there is a mute jammer close by which i believe prevented that from activating oh no not I think a mute it's, jammer. it's also it the, the fact that it was just an old footstep as well <laughs> yeah it was an old footstep my bad but still, um, it will be given at the very least some, or should be rather given some understanding of the general whereabouts of uh, one of the players, so they should know that there's one on the rafters. But the issue is that Hard Explode still hasn't, she knows that there were some footsteps here by Maestro. So surely she'll be able to scan those fresh footprints before they expire so that they will be able to at the very least get some good information about where Angry Wolf is and maybe gone walkabouts could really go in for a swing because that surely should be an easy peek at the very least, the moment they have the information. Time is definitely not on the side of Barry's bees though. Angry Wolf is going to be getting that first kill onto Gorn Walkabouts. Brunek with that second onto Please Don't Bully Me. And this feels just like a repetition of the first round that Barry's bees was attacking that cash of CC site. Because Brunek is going to be getting another onto Hotto. Corvice onto Small Chaser. And Angry Wolf with that final kill onto Hot Explodes. Once again, another flawless round for Kingswoman. Yeah, and the fact that how well can they seem to be able to look down the site is just absolutely stunning, really. Um, it seems that <laughs> Barry's bees can't seem to be able to find uh, themselves uh, those right engagements. Again, it seems that the maybe the drone game is not particularly going too well or rather utilized as well. And few of those kind of 
micro mistakes that seem to be being made are the ones that end up stacking up here into a one and very unfortunate loss there for themselves as uh, round five is uh, on the horizon and we still yet to see a single round win from Barry's Bees. Yeah, I feel like Barry's Bees, maybe they're a little bit intimidated, maybe they're a little bit unsure as to how to really approach things from the most effective angle, because at this rate, a lot of their actions are incredibly slow. You know, that round we've seen, they, there was still no real trades, no real anything happening apart from a CCTV war opening within the first two minutes and a half, pretty much. And there was just 30 seconds left to really push yourself onto site. And for a team that seems to not be that confident at this point, that is a scenario that you most want to avoid. Because you don't want to be hurrying anything, you want to take things slow, you want to take things methodical, which does mean that you need to have the appropriate intel to act on it. I'm talking about intel, actually Brunek, I believe, just finished, to, uh, finished setting up rather the cameras, so... Bernabeu will be getting plenty of that information going, and once again she is going to be going on a... Rome. Not sure if this time Barry's Bees will be much more cautious about their approach, but at the very least they were able to spawn on a much more safer side, as, <laughs> slightly further tried. away from Bernabeu, so this is a good beginning, although Bernabeu already knowing full well that the push Attackers may be coming through maybe the lodgy office, maybe uh, through the garage, and just essentially by method of elimination could find herself some early engagements. Yeah, the lower garage walls are opened up, which does mean Bernabé has a few more angles to really watch out for and to make sure that she doesn't really get surprised from any of them. There isn't a huge effort to really roam clear or to really secure any parts of the building, which could be fine, it's never an issue, as long as you have the appropriate flank denial set up. A flank denial, I mean, you know, Nomad Air Jazz. Unfortunately, the Barry's Beast did not bring a Nomad this time, so it would most likely just be flank drones, possibly small Chaz's Claymore, or just an awareness that something could be happening. Well, something will be happening Attackers most definitely. It's going walkabouts to be denied very quickly without even her being able to plant the charge. And well, that's a whole lot more information that is actually being relayed. Very nice camera by Brunek. And that relays such a huge amount of information. Surely another C4 does come around. But instead of we not seeing just anything yet, Mardina is fairly far away. So it sounds like maybe Angry Wolf, but pretty sure, yeah, Angry Wolf already used up all of her impact grenades. So it's more so just Brunek trying to act up on, on top of her own camp information, which would be actually pretty huge if that would have worked out because Small Chaz has actually been sitting around on the very same position for quite a while now. Yeah, definitely. To always be able to carry some C4s when you're going for that charge and arsenal site is going to be super impactful. But something that's just as impactful is going to be Burna Bear roaming because she gets his, because she gets the second kill of the day onto Hotter as well. And now that's two hard breaches down, which does mean Hot Explodes is the only one left to really open up any further hatches. However, she did use two sets of Havana breaches on that kitchen hatch, which means she has to be incredibly careful about which one to choose. I'm talking about choosing the the engagements right now. Bernabé could be in a little bit of an issue, but very sharp on her skills. We'll be able to take out Heart Explodes. Now it's all down to Small Chazza to really hold that long angle. She has a tighter angle set up here, and we'll be deciding to swing up on that, but won't be really finding anything. But meanwhile, already quite some time has been already used up, and oh, going for, or rather, please don't bully me, trying to find herself a frag, but right now running into an absolute mad crossfire from King's Women will be shut down and well unfortunately it is going to be yet another loss for Barry's Bees as a fifth round has been achieved by King's Women. I think out of all the rounds though that was more successful on Barry's Bees behalf because they were able to really get those hatches open and there wasn't as much casualty as the last time when they went for that kitchen uh, I mean, not that kitchen, that church and arsenal take. However, once again, it is their lack of awareness with that Rome game that really is just going to be their downfall. Because a lot of the times when they are dying, it's not because you know they're, they're losing out on trades or it's not because they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. It's really just the, the defender's roam who's surprising them, catching them off guard so that they're not able to respond in time and really refract that out. Yeah, it's... 
seeming to be Defenders that reoccurring kind of pattern that's seeming to be plaguing, fortunately, Barry's views. But on the, on the positive side, four kings women, though, they have been able to smash up their games really well. It seems that some of the games against some of the tougher opponents has certainly uh, been very beneficial here for the Kings women roster. And certainly seeing some of the improvements, the fact how much, uh, like you mentioned before, tightly knit they are playing, is definitely a very a positive um, showcase and a positive change that um, I believe we actually see in Kings women make a few of those kind of similar uh, mistakes uh, previously when they were uh, whenever they were, they were playing against some of the um, more powerful teams yeah that's why I think you know to start off a tournament even if you are going to be matching up against people who are ranked really highly such as elevate or nocturnal to be able to practice against them and to be able to really quickly learn where your mistakes are where the holes in your defender you know strats are it really lets you have an almost advantage when you're versing teams that aren't as highly rated. This time, Angry Wolf is going to be holding construction with a bandit charge on that charge hole, which <laughs> does mean that no quick wall will get opened. Unfortunately, Barry's Beast did not bring an ace this time. Instead, they just have one hard breacher, which means Gorm Walkabouts will need to be a little bit selective about which walls she does go for. I would assume she does go for those spa lounge walls. Yeah. But to do that, she will need to first clear Burner Bear out from that trick place. Yeah, and there will be only a single set of ADSs, so theoretically, as much as if she is able to thread the needle, she should be able to get rid of that ADS fairly quickly. Um, but again, that will be still under a big question mark. Trying to get as quickly as possible. There we go, that's one set. Still needs to get maybe another one, but yeah, at the moment, this is um, looking. Pretty good for King's Women. But yeah, I do also want to mention about Angry Wolf position. Last time we actually streamed their game on Clubhouse, they actually were attempting to hold the um, hold this very same position but as Goyo with that wall reinforced. So seeing some uh, adjustments is certainly a good thing to witness. But also, meanwhile, we've seen a frag by Please Don't Bully Me onto Burner Bear. And that very quickly denied any kind of bandit tricking that could have been done there. So... Should be an easy breach for Gorn walkabouts, but Brunek is downstairs and hoping to find maybe some redemption here. Hodo is going to be getting that headshot onto Mardina, which does mean that Castle player is going to be out. This time, with the Iana coming in from Please Don't Bully Me, they have a lot more intel to act upon, which means that potentially there won't be as many losses to your attacking team when you are trying to vault through walls, when you are trying to vault through windows, and this definitely works their advantage because Please Don't Bully Me on a double kill this round gets my second onto Angry Wolf. Yeah, Hodo finding that kill as well is a awesome awesome way to really flush out one of the defenders and now in a 1v4 situation things have turned around very quickly king's women looking a little bit more scarce on their resources and well with hard explosives already going in for a plant the whole side has been pretty much locked down and uh, now it's all just a pending clutch really from brunek Brunek has gotten a fair few kills this entire match, so it's not unachievable that she, that she could get this clutch, but she definitely needs to act very quickly. That logistic door being barricaded off isn't going to work to Brunek's advantage this time because it does mean that she is almost funneled into that bedroom door. She manages to see the feet of the uh, Ayana. Downs, please don't bully me, doesn't quite manage to finish her off. The clock is ticking and Smorchaza, through that window in construction, is going to get that kill onto Brunek. Well, at the very least, we shall be seeing not a flawless um, first half from um, Barry B. So that is a solid start for them. But uh, now that we are going to be going on King's Women's attack, comes the question of how well can they really play it out? Because for them, they still need two rounds to win out this map. Whereas uh, now that Barry's Bees are going to be on the defense, they would have a whole lot more advantages to really just play it out as passively as they want and pretty much just wait for the aggression and the mistakes from the attacking side. Yeah, I, I however think that if King's Women are playing as well as they did on defense, the next few rounds shouldn't be too much of a struggle for King's Women, as long as they play to how they practice, as long as they do have a strategy they are following and they Defenders act quicker than what Barry's Bees were acting daggers. on attack, they should have a good chance in cleaning up these next two rounds. 
Oh, well, I guess we'll get that answer <laughs> very soon. See, TV Room and Cash is going to be the next place for the defense. And uh, looking at the lineup, it's just about actually borderline nearly the same as uh, what Kingswin will bring it over. But instead of having a bandit, it is going to be a Kayad that is going to be... Um, assisting with the breach denial. Curious though as to where his electric flows are going to be um, going down because that's will be that will be deciding as to how well can it be cleared out. Pretty much. It's very interesting that she's going for a, uh, a, a an electric claw in lounge because a lot of the times the first action to take when clearing out any electrified wall in CCTV is going into lounge so that you can Sophia charge it from below so you can potentially open up the CCTV walls because a lot of the times it is a bandit charge instead on that wall, not a K charge. As it is that K charge does get taken down relatively quickly and it does mean that those CCTV walls are going to be opened up. I would recommend you know, for any aspiring K players that there are a few actually almost invincible K spots for that CCTV wall. Those spots yes. are definitely not below. They are just to use the terrain in CCTV as well as that top rope area. Yeah, like the, there is a little bit of a circumference that you can use those electric claws that I'm sure there's a bundle of videos on YouTube that you can <laughs> reference from. Yeah, surely there's going to be a plentiful amount of information in that regard. But for now, well, unfortunately for Gone Walkabouts, she hasn't yet discovered those spots. So both of her Kaid charges have been already extinguished. So now she's pretty much now going down to, uh, well, hopefully not commit Sudoku just yet with the C4. <laughs> Instead, it's Bernabe that will be assisting with that frag. And we're already 4v5, and uh, with a minimal um, health losses for King's Women, this is a good beginning for their push. Yeah, especially in considering that that CCTV wall is opened as well. It does mean that Baron's Beast is going to have more angles to be careful of. Small Charizard is going to be slightly pressured in that cash room. She should be safe as long as she sticks to around those deaths. Barry's bees are quite close by to be able to capitalize on this. If Please Don't Bully Me does go a little bit more aggressive with a little bit of intel as well, she should get that kill. But unfortunately, Burner Bear manages to get a 2k onto Please Don't Bully Me this time. Yeah, that does leave the remaining set of players of Barry's bees up around the site. And, uh, well, neither of those three players are going to be really bothering to really move around or just they are planning to hold their positions at for as long as possible. Flashbangs are coming around and unfortunately for Otto there are no ADSs so it's certainly an issue for her whereas for Bernabé this is perfect setup already finding herself a triple kill. Runic already also getting the plan down. This is now the timer that is going to be starting to tick against the defenders and well exactly at that time it is going to be well surely this is going to be a quad kill for Bernabé if not an ace. Renova does get that quad kill down and all she needs to do is swing through and get that kill onto Small Chaza and she does! Which does mean that this is going to be an ace for her. An ace play from Bernabé is certainly a grand thing and well that's one of the that's one of the uh, rounds to go into the highlights as well surely. Oh it's match point like you said. 6-1 scoreline. Certainly looking like well, King's Women are doing well, coming in prepared more so uh, for this very matchup compared to Barry's Bees. Unfortunately for Barry's Bees, they had some pretty good setup, like we said. They have good theory, but it seems like the actual execution of that theory seems to be a little bit lacking. So hopefully maybe for some of the future matches that they will have, they will be able to um, adapt to that issue that they are currently having. But Church and Arsenal is going to be the final side that we shall be seeing here Defenders, protect um, your bombs from between these two teams and potentially the final round and the final side to be defended at least within these series yeah and it's a little bit concerning to see Barry's bees that they haven't really adapted you know especially from that one round that they won from attack I really thought that maybe they were just getting things under control they were really understanding how to push together and to really take control together but after that last round, it made me a little bit concerned because it almost felt like shifting from attack to defense just really set off their momentum and they weren't able to really adapt instantly to how Kingsman were playing. On the other hand, 
Kingsman took the change in rounds quite well. There was really no change in their, their capable Attackers teamwork. There was no difference in how it. smoothly that they coordinated the attack, especially with Banner Banger going in, not really being punished at all, but having all the adequate intel to capitalize on all those kills is going to be quite an advantage. Well, Walkabouts does choose a very interesting maestro camera. I believe maybe she's going for a little bit of a vertical angle, maybe trying to deny any breach, breach attempts from below. But this position is quite vulnerable, considering that there is a soft hatch right above where she is standing. As well as that, Mardini is actually hoping to maybe harm down a few of the few of the defenders. Does actually spot the maestro and. Oh boy, that could be an issue because right now, going walkabout is just straight away bolting out of there, which does tell Kingswomen that there might be something positioned in the logistics office. Yeah, especially if you if you weren't sure before, you know those very intimidating holes from above is going to give something away, and it is going to be Vernabeer getting that kill onto Gorn Walkabouts. I actually believe you know Gorn Walkabouts almost delivered herself into Vernabeer just running. <laughs> Which does make me a little bit concerned again about how much intel really Barry's Beast has in their pocket to really act on. Yeah, not a whole lot it seems. There's still a few cameras set up by... Please don't bully me, so certainly a C4 play could be coming around. But that is still yet to be called out. I'm, I'm assuming that they're still going to be... Uh, that Gone Walkabout is going to be on the cameras and are waiting for just the right moment for it to happen. But already C4 has been extinguished and only... Half a health damage to Bernabe, and even then, I believe that uh, that was actually while she was uh, taking down Gorn Walkabouts. Yeah, and taking down Gorn, Gorn Walkabouts does mean that those impact grenades have been taken out of the equation as well. So, whereas when Kizumi was on defense and we did see Corvai's impact trick that kitchen hatch a few times, that won't be available to Barry's bees at this point because I don't believe any other operator on their defender lineup actually has any impact, which does mean that Mardina is going to be able to open up that kitchen hatch relatively unharmed as well. Exactly. And it is going to be only, please don't bully me, to actually keep on picking this very angle whilst Heart Explodes tries to find herself a frag. Please don't bully me actually opens up on Mardina really well without actually losing any HP, and that certainly makes things a whole lot more difficult for King's Women to really go about. It's Hotto that did try to maybe go in for a peek, but right now the whole control of the blue tunnel has been actually completely forfeited. Bernabeu and Anglewolf are going to attempt to just go in for the push flat out here, and should find the shot onto Please Don't Bully Me. Time is already running low, and oh, Bernabeu completely unaware of the position of the Valkyrie, and this could be huge. The plant is already starting to go down. Please Don't Bully Me finds herself a double kill. Make it a triple, make it nearly a quad. Brunek was able to plant the diffuser, but right now in a 1v3 situation, things are certainly not looking too pretty. There's the shot. There's the clutch and hot explodes, able to get the diffuse. Yeah, that was a huge round coming out of Barry's Bees, and it was exactly what they needed, considering it was match point over to King's Women as well, which does mean that Barry's Bees is going to be still holding on a little bit longer. Not quite yet is it going to be over. So going on to the next defender site, I really want to see the exact same performance being repeated. You know, they were able to cover their crossfires, they were able to really capitalize on the attacker's push which is exactly what Barry's Beast has been lacking up until now. Yeah, they them being able to really play off a few of the hidden positions is a great thing, and I would imagine that right now Brunek, uh, or rather Bernabeu, will be uh, uh, definitely regretting not checking that angle, <laughs> because she could have very easily spotted that position by um, Please Don't Bully Me, and that could have been a completely different round, but alas, didn't really happen, so for Barry to be to get another chance at staying in this matchup, but still, they're still facing that very unsettling thought bombs. of, well, they don't really have any more um, chances really to retry certain, uh, certain plays, certain sites, this is where they need to start ramp uh, ramping up their numbers, ramping up their wins, and... Uh, the moment they lose this round, it is pretty much going to be hit. Yeah, just as you said, Kuthu, there really is no leeway for any form of mistake at this point, because any mistake that does get punished is just going to mean the round is going to end, or the match is going to end instantly to Kingswoman. So, definitely, 
a fair bit of pressure on Barry's B's Five behalf, so no, you know, just just don't let it get to you. Focus on the game, and it'll be all right. I'm a little bit curious about Barry's B's offering a lineup. They have chosen to go with a Cade rather than a Bandit, which is something that you do see stereotypically a lot of the time on that Jin and Bedroom site, because Bandit is just quite effective at tricking. However, having a K does mean you can explore vertical angles with your electric claws, which is something that we've seen Gorn Walkabouts do. Admittedly, on that Cash and CCTV site where she placed it below on a soft surface, it wasn't quite as effective. But this time, with Please Don't Bully Me watching from below as well, it definitely is going to pay off because that first uh, the first lance of the Kali charge isn't going to be able to really capitalize at all because there is no electrical there. So you're just <laughs> wasting gadgets at this point. Yeah, I would imagine Corvise right now feeling a little bit... Well, surprised I suppose would be one of the ways to really call it as um, you know, all three of the lances are completely gone. And she wasn't able to dispose of the electrical. Whereas they didn't... I don't think they even got the idea of actually needing to clear out the bathroom because this is where the electrical is hidden. Please don't bully me on that room could actually throw a spanner and works off AGW whenever that actually happens. But right now it seems like King's Women have elected to actually go from a polar opposite position where they should still be able to apply just enough pressure. Yeah, it looks like they have completely changed their plan of attack. Normally you would see a more of a spa attack but at this point, it looks to be more of a construction-centered push, purely because, you know, all those Kali Lancers have been depleted, Ooh. which does mean that there won't be any form of electrified defense. Gorn Walkabout is going to be going on a flank. She doesn't quite seem to be spotted out yet. She did punch that top red wall, but I don't know if they were aware. Gorn Walkabout put some heavy damage into Brunei. She takes a fair amount herself as well. Isn't able to finish off Brunei. And she does go in for a swing, but it will be Brunei Bear getting that kill onto Gorn Walkabout, which is entirely unfortunate because it does mean that Brunei will get picked up as well. With well, that said, please don't bully me. We'll actually try to go in for another late flank, and that could actually throw in an even bigger spanner in the works because right now Hoda was actually able to return some fire back onto Bernabeu and shut her down. There's still Brunek that is very heavily tagged up as well that Hoda could really dish out some more damage already an even heftier damage has been dealt by oh, please don't bully me. That is Corvise now down the on side but completely unaware about that fact. And now it's down to Mardina to try to clutch it out. Once again, 1v3 situation certainly not looking particularly too well. And to Hoda already full well aware about the positioning of where Mardina could be. Well, we'll be shutting her down. Yeah, and this is exactly what we want to see from Barry's Bees. They're really picking up their momentum. They're really saying, you know, those attacking rounds where we didn't quite do as well. It doesn't matter because we're going to show you an incredibly strong defense. And they sure have. They've shown us three, uh, they've shown us two rounds in a row where they haven't really let their nerves get to them. They haven't really let the fact that Kingswoman is on match point really affect them at all. And they're still going incredibly strong. Oh yeah, 100%. And it definitely shows that right now, maybe Kingswoman are kind of losing maybe their momentum. We've been talking a fair few times that some teams are... Uh, very dependent on some of the momentum that they can ramp up and the moment that is being thwarted they just can't seem to make any kind of return there the Attackers moment they kind of being left bomb. questioning each and every one of their actions in the previous round so maybe this is what is happening here maybe this is why things women are unable at the moment to find themselves that final round win maybe CCTV is going to be uh, that round for them to take because last time it was actually won out by them. So this is possibly one of the best case scenario, I suppose, for them. Yeah, definitely. And for people, for Barry's bees, you definitely want to be aware of the mistakes that you made in the prior rounds. You want to know that possibly having a K charge in lounge where the wall is where the floor is soft is not the way around it. Five this time instead, left, four, I'm already liking the positions of her K charges. She it, it does seem like she does know a few positions of where to put those K charges. So to be able to act on that it will mean that Corvice won't be as effective on that Kali. Obviously if they choose to go from a different point of attack, if King's Women choose to possibly open up suicide window they should be able to see those car or at least 1k charge on the wall. They should be able to at least get half of that CCTV wall open, which is still a great achievement. 
Yeah, it seems at the moment though we just only seen a breach from Mardina into the garage wall to get a crossfire. At the moment, those lances are not really doing much, and once again, Koba has used up all three of her charges without really doing anything. Kind of the last resort, I suppose, is going to be that Ash charge, and even that is not really going to be cutting it. So, once again, King's Women are going to be uh, forced to be funneled through the choke points that are being set up here by Barry's Bees, and uh, there's definitely, well, not the best case scenario here, and probably a decision to maybe bring in an IQ or maybe a Twitch would, uh, would have been a bit more beneficial, you could say. But, talking about the beneficial plays, please don't bully me. Actually, just got spotted, I believe, by the drone, so right now it's going to be a manhound out for her. Yeah, please don't bully me doesn't quite seem to have a lot of backup going for her. She does manage to extract herself out relatively safely, but just as I'm saying this, she does manage to run into the crossfire of Bernabeu once again. I don't know if Bernabeu knows that she did actually down. Please don't bully me. There is no defender close to her that's able to really save the Valkyrie at this point, which does mean that she is just going to be able to uh, slowly crawl away and hope that Bernabeu won't be coming any closer. Yeah, well, talking about getting any closer, Small Chazel was actually able to slow down the push and shut down Angry Wolf before any more damage has been already dealt. Don't bully me is about to bleed out, and well, there we go. There's the confirmation. Bernabe should now already know that this flank has been completely shut down. Now, Hotto's position here could be very crucial here because Bernabe already has been dishing out quite some punishment. I mean, looking at the 16 to 4, there's really one way to really show that she is the that dominant unit for King's Women to really push some of the advantage here and right now if she swings yet yeah, finds a successful kill that is a huge opening here and taking control of the construction site is Bomb definitely going to be making things a Attackers whole lot easier here as oh tries to get into a gunfight but no hard explodes yeah, actually will be still team. staying quite safe here as gone walkabouts picks up a frag for herself already a push in happening Bernabeu with a triple kill as well as that Corvus is already taking Ten control but go. there's no diffuser in hand and right now it's all down to small chances to really go. prevent any of that plan to go down. Two seconds team. remaining, the frag needs to come, to come around, but no, time Operator has run out, out just time. like that. Once again, King's Women got punished for very poor time management. That was actually incredibly close on Barry's B's behalf. You know, Small Chaza <laughs> was maybe slightly more aggressive with how she played. Maybe she was a little bit louder. That could have instantly alerted two King's Women where exactly she was playing. And as... You know, as a small defense, as a small defense operator with just an SMG 11 and a shotgun, you really don't want to be caught in a situation where you have to face off against Bernabe. Because as you were saying, Bernabe is the main fragging power behind Kingsman at this point. And she has shown over and over again in these rounds that she is capable of getting those kills when she needs to. So to be able to clutch out a situation like that, even if you weren't able to get the kills, is still an achievement regardless. Attackers need Most to definitely. And defuse yeah. bombs. Being able to know exactly when to not push, when to push, when to engage is, certainly has benefited, be, uh, was beneficial, sorry, um, Barry's bees as well. So already only two point difference, it's crazy to think that we started off um, this half with uh, pretty much 6-1 scoreline after a few, after the first round of the second half has been worn out by King's Women, and after that, it's already been a three-round streak by Barry's Bees to pull, well, uh, so far, a comeback. Yeah, and if I was on Barry's Bees here, definitely this momentum that's building up and up and up is something that can keep you going for the next few rounds. We have shown that on defense, or both teams have shown that on defense, this is their strong point. Sure, King's Women did get the first few rounds into their pocket when they were on defense, but now that they're on attack, it looks like a completely different story because Barry's Beast has really taken control of this entire match and it really shows that they have practiced how to hold these sites, so they aren't really phased at all. Not at all. This time we do see a bit of a change up in uh, the plans for King's Women as they are opening a few, a couple more openings, the namely the dirt tunnel that just got popped open. Another breach is going to be coming around and I'm assuming that is... Where is that actually? Oh, okay. Wait, why is my dinner using usual charges on soft wall? 
I'm confused. I... The wolf was just there, but eh, maybe there was some bigger brain idea there. Just wasn't really voiced. But either way, Breach is there. Um, I hope that there's still yet. There's still at least one set of Excaros charges, which will be, I'm assuming, used on the memorial hatch as the uh, attempt at getting rid of the kitchen hatch will be pretty much thwarted. And, uh, well, maybe right now King's Women need to start going in for the pushes pretty soon because already half a round has been already used up and uh, not a whole lot of meaningful ground has been really taken here by King's Women. Yes, sorry, I'm still a little bit perplexed as to why they use the Havana <laughs> pellets on the spa wall. I, I, I genuinely cannot think of a single reason as to why, because it does mean that they are not going to have enough Havana pellets to go for uh, all, all, a lot of the hatches. The C4 is going to be flying out, but it doesn't quite manage to get those charges at all, which I, you know, at this rate, maybe having just one set of Havana pellets was the plan, because kitchen hatch is opened. Yeah, with kitchen hatch now being open, as well as that, the other pressure point being added up from the dirt tunnel, this could be a huge position here. So, uh, Corvise is going to be positioning herself with that sniper rifle, as well as that, it's Bernabeu that is actually going to be spearheading the push, already taking control of the entrance from the dirt tunnel as Oak nearly gets sniped by her own teammate. We'll be fighting the shot until Please Don't Bully Me now. Please Don't Bully Me was one of the key players that was able to swing a few of the rounds around. Now it's down to Gorn Walkabout, and she's just going in, she's going full send, and right now just frantically spraying around. We'll be fighting actually Hibana as the plan will be going down, stuck, and now it's the timer that is going to be starting to run against the defense, but it doesn't seem to be really phasing the pad player whatsoever. Benabe is going to be getting a double kill onto Gorn Walkabouts, which does mean that Hotto, Hot Explosion, and Small Chaz are really need to clutch out this round. But it is going to be Bernabe getting that kill onto Small Chaz, a Corvice picking up the second, and Brunek with that last kill to clean up this round. And despite Barry's B's almost comeback, it is going to be Kingswoman taking out Clubhouse for their win. 7 4 is the scoreline, but boy oh boy, some of those rounds were very close. Uh, not to mention the fact that Barry's Bees were able to muster up a three round streak. No, oh, please, thank you. <clears throat> three round streak for themselves, and Bernabe dropping a 22 round, or rather, 22 kill game is a huge testament here for her skill set and how much of an amazing addition she is to the King's Women roster. Yeah, you know, there were multiple rounds during that entire map where Bernabe was just getting your 4Ks, 3Ks. It, it, she was just she was just flying across the map. She wasn't really punished. There wasn't really a lot of flank denial set up by Barry's Bees, which furthermore meant that Bernabe could just really do whatever she wanted at that point. Yeah, Bernabe pretty much was given the carte blanche, really, at just doing whatever wild swings she really wanted. And, well, that pretty much was one of the few reasons why some of the rounds were won, but uh, maybe for the f further rounds they will need to maybe make an upgrade or get a few more players to kind of get on board with some of those frags because certainly relying on a single player may not be the uh, best decision, but alas, congratulations to them. They are going to be getting themselves a, a set of, I believe, three points here for their win. Yeah, and for members of Kingswoman, I can't imagine how happy an event this is because, again, they haven't really had the best season so far and they haven't really showed the best performance yet. But after today, that was definitely a very good performance out from them. Sure, they lost a few attacking rounds to Barry's Bees, but ultimately, it doesn't matter because they won the map. Exactly. Well, that's it for this matchup. Now, we do have one more matchup coming right up that is going to be Nocturnal versus Shadownet, and that is going to be right after our break so stay tuned get maybe some more hydration maybe get some popcorn because the next one is going to be an absolute banger too siege yeah i've heard of it and i am the goat when i'm attacking no room is safe doors yeah i think i remember them before i discovered windows the thinking man's door I've come up with something I like to call a spawn kill. You've probably never heard of it. Because when I'm in defense, nobody gets in my bank. Teammates, 
droning. Listen, I've got all of the intelligence I need right here. My only team is me, my gun, and my skills. Enter into a new dimension of gaming and unlock your gaming experience. Powerful and portable with uncompromised graphics performance. The way you play will never be the same.
into a new dimension of gaming. And push your PC to the extreme with uncompromised graphics performance. So compact you have to see it to believe it. The way you play will never be the same. gentlemen welcome back to the matchup number two of week six of women's league Phil and Pi still on the microphone and Pi we just seen a pretty well fairly close game between Kings women and Barry's Bees where we pretty much nearly saw a full-blown comeback from Barry's Bees yeah, uh, Barry's Bees, you know, they started off a little bit slow. They started off a little uncertain where the match definitely looked like it was going to be in Kings women's favor. But out of nowhere, when the round swapped, when Barry's Bees went from attack to defense, we really saw their strength and really what they've been hiding from us almost. And they actually almost managed to come back from that, which uh, they tied up the match still relatively closer than what it was predicted to be at the start, you know, managing to finish it off, losing despite that. But it was very close in a 7-4. Yeah, 7-4 was the final score line on the clubhouse, but we have one more game to uh, to cast and to watch, and that is going to be Nocturnal versus Shadownet. The, I believe, currently first place versus currently third place in the, the leaderboard. Very keen to see how that will unravel. Meanwhile, off stream, Elevate got themselves yet another confident win. That is a 7 one scoreline against the Musketeers, aka the ex Nutty Gaming roster. And uh, well, Nocturnal versus Shadow should be definitely a close one, I reckon, just because how um how well they were performing previously, how dominant they were against 71st. And um here we might be seeing just a clash of two giants, I reckon. Yeah, definitely. You know, considering the last few matches that we did see Shadownet get streamed on, they were against teams that were ranked below them in terms of the round robin ranking. So to be able to see them really face off against someone who should be, you know, if not at a higher level than what they are, to see them almost being challenged a little bit should be good because regardless of what happens today, Shadownet is going to be improving, Shadownet is going to be learning, and Nocturnal definitely doesn't have this easy either. You know, sure they have the first position for now. But to verse someone in the top three is never going to be an easy task. And you definitely want to bring 100% of your game in so that you can perform to the best. Yeah, it's definitely going to be quite a challenge here for Shadownet. For, um, and this time, I reckon, yeah, they will need to put bust out their um, strat, book, strat book, put all of their might into this matchup because this is going to be one of the rather more important ones and potentially even play for an upset here to maybe dethrone external off their position here now let's have a look closer at the rosters as well of these two wonderful teams to really kind of dissect what could possibly come out from all of them and to kick things off it is going to be nocturnal um any kind of thoughts about this roster so far well coming straight from nocturnal's roster and you know once again we do see a lot of familiar names to the past season that we have played in women's league members of nocturnal do include Aussie, Serenity, Crescent, AJ Tiger X, Sav, and Archon as their team coach. So they are quite a capable roster. There isn't really a lot of variation. They don't really have a lot of substitutes, which does mean that the main roster does get to play together over and over again and really build on that existing synergy. Yeah, and they were able to actually perfect their synergy quite substantially. They were the ones that actually um, took quite a few very convincing wins um, against some of the other teams, although against Elevate, they still remain to struggle. So maybe they just yet to um, up their um, skill level even higher. But let's have a look at their challenges. The currently third place team on the leaderboard, it is Shadownet. Mengzi, Mons, Diana, Sawyer, Crips, Time for Pie, and Crimspec um, as the um, team coach. This is an incredibly strong roster as well. You know, the past few times that we actually seen Shadownet, we have noticed a little bit of a development with them where they started off a little bit slow, but 
especially the last time I believe that they were actually on stream, they really showed us a more dominating side that they were capable of, which was a lot more aggressive than what they had played. In the past, a lot of Shadow Nets uh, positioning, a lot of their playstyle was more slower based, was more strategic based. Whereas I, I believe the last time we seen them on Clubhouse, they acted very coordinated and they had a, a lot of very fast executes. Well, we're actually going to be seeing those fast ex executes actually uh, be performed on a very flexible map for these kinds of plays. Let's actually have a look at our map vetoes and uh, see where we're actually going to find ourselves. And um, well, unsurprisingly, it is going to be Oregon yet again making a return. Yet another map that has been actually fairly frequently picked. Uh, personally, for me, one of my favorite ones, but just for the sheer fact that I seeming to be having just a little bit more um, win rate <laughs> on that map in ranked. Uh, but look, it's still a, a map that I still feel that yet to be fully stratted out. We still yet to see a full set of um, some vertical gameplay to come out from from this map, so a fair few teams still kind of going for those uh, one-dimensional pushes that can be shut down pretty quickly. So maybe here uh, between these two teams we shall be seeing that very outcome. Uh, but look, I'm just I'm keen, I'm keen on this uh, on this game. I'm, I'm keen on this match. Now before we get even to this, um, we do need to actually. Um, also mentioned that it is going to be um, Shadownet. Um, um, though it will be, pardon, Nocturnal to kick things off on um, defense, and um, and um, m the possibilities of what that could introduce to us as well. Yeah. So for a map like Oregon, it is going to be quite strategic operated so to be able to start on defense is going to bring a, a little bit of an advantage at least to you as a team especially if you are going to be the number one ranked team especially in this uh, round robin to be able to hold a defender side with the momentum in your control because you can start off however you want you can start off on whichever side you want you can really surprise the attackers to really challenge them in any form of way and I feel like as a team Nocturnal is definitely the team that could potentially do that to Shadownet so it'd be interesting to see how Shadownet really respond to this whether they will react quickly whether they do adapt quickly or whether or not they really fall prey to Nocturnal's momentum and just get swept up with it yeah definitely well let's quickly have a look at the Oregon before we get straight into the games but look I'm just I'm keen to see what this will bring us, what we'll be seeing, um, what kind of strats can we see from either one of the rosters. Interestingly enough, just looking at the uh, um, lobby as well, we won't be seeing Minxie play tonight. It will be time for Pi that will be playing in as a sub. And uh, look, I'm just I'm keen and excited for the matchup to come around. Shadownet. To kick things off on attack, but looking at the bands, what do you reckon we shall be expecting here? I feel like for two teams like Shadownet and Nocturnal, they will go for quite default bands. You know, something that you do see out of Oregon could just potentially be the Thatcher, just as an instant attacker ban. Wouldn't be surprised by that at all. I'm so yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, Thatcher will be pretty much a no brainer here at this point. For the next attack op, now we have a bit of a kind of a coin toss, I suppose. It could be either maybe Maverick, maybe Ace, or maybe something like a Nomad, actually, because we've seen a fair few Nomad bands, especially on Oregon, uh, considering how well she can really um, deny some of the flanks. Yeah, especially as a team like Nocturnal, who are quite confident when it comes to gunfights, you definitely want to be taking advantage of any form of flanking that you can do. So not quite a Nomad ban, but a Jackal <laughs> almost achieves the same thing because he does deny a lot of that roam potential with his vision. That is correct. Well, first ban of the defense is going to be Womai. Uh, that will be once again hindering the defense's ability to deny some of the projectiles and will definitely will be forcing the defense to be a little bit more proactive about their 
plays rather than um, being able to sit kind of patiently for most of the round and just to wait for the final 20 seconds before the push happens. Mirabad coming out finally is again no real surprise a lot of the times you will just see some form of an intel operator being denied and Mira is definitely one of those operators. Possibly not the traditional intel operator that you would think of but with those one-way black mirrors they definitely give the defenders an advantage that you don't really want them to be having. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Mirrors certainly can be, especially on um, a few of the sites, could definitely be a game changer here, but obviously we shall not be seeing that. Now, a bit of a interesting, well, bait by Crescent to swap around from Cap to Valk will still be notifying that there will be some roam to be attempted to be achieved by, um, I, was, I knew I said Elevate, Maternal. <laughs> uh, whereas, um, a very quick response from Shadownet will be seeing Time for Pi actually bring a um, a Nomad. Oh boy. Yeah, we are unfortunately going to be going for a rehost. And. Um, um, as I attempt to really <laughs> nail my spelling. But yeah, look, we shall be returning back to us. That does give us a little bit more time to um, talk about uh, what is going to be, uh, what could be happening, and maybe do a little bit of a theory craft, as uh, hopefully we shall be, yep, there we are, we are back. <laughs> Rehost is underway, straight, uh, straight off the bat, and a bit unfortunate that the moss wasn't really <laughs> working there for AJ, but um, we already got a little bit of a glimpse at the lineups that we could be seeing. We saw already a Maverick pick, we saw... Um, essentially double hard breach uh, pick and funnily enough instead of say like the usual kind of remote breaches like Hibana like Ace we seeing those uh, two hard breaches that are getting up close and personal with some of these um, with some of these breaches now do you reckon this could be an issue or do you do you reckon um, it's just all kind of part of the plan I think if you were to bring a duo hard breacher, I, I, I definitely think Thermite and Maverick are two of the strongest combinations that you can bring. Maverick purely because his gadget really denies any form of tricking that the defenders so should they go for it. it. It really denies that, you know, he's able to even open up a minuscule hole, throw in a grenade and really deny any charges on that wall. And Thermite is just always going to be such a solid pick because he is one of those operators that is able to open up the entire hard wall to make it, you know, not only vaultable, but also runnable and walkable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely feeling like, um, um, sorry, pardon me, uh, a little bit, um, being, um, distracted on <laughs> typing, but yeah, um, few of the picks are certainly, um, quite unusual or maybe rather yeah it's just uh, some thoughts that maybe um the teams just want to make sure that their breaches are just big enough essentially to get going and have the sidelines running for them um but apart from that really yeah i mean there's not much to be really said until we see the um the action actually start coming around um and uh, look the only thing really that I can also think about is maybe um, the way how Nocturnal are setting themselves up. If their roam is going to be successful, that could really uh, derail the plan of Shadownet uh, for their push. Because it definitely looked like they weren't really keen on... Um, um, what would be the right way to go? They weren't really keen on some of that roam play, on some of that roam clear, and rather instead were, would just look like they would be trying to force certain push to happen say the attic push say the um say the walk-in closet and kind of from there on we may be seeing some differences to be made yeah, and uh, with the six pick coming out from Time for Pi as well, from that buck into the Nomad, it does show that Shadow Note are aware, at least a little bit, to how Nocturnal or how aggressively Nocturnal can play. So to be able to have not only flank drones up, but also Nomad air jabs available 
to really deny any form of flank will definitely prove to Shadownet's advantage. I can only hope that Shadownet will be utilizing that gadget effectively because you know when gadgets aren't utilized effectively, it doesn't matter what sort of operator lineup you're bringing because you're not capitalizing on it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we still have a little bit of a technical issue, so we are just going to go uh, quickly to the short break as we just fix everything up, and we shall be back with yet another game, well, well with the very start of match number two, just a short few moments, so stay tuned. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we are back yet again. Finally, all the technical difficulties have been finally solved, and we are going to be seeing the first round to go on the way. It is going to be well, Nocturnal to kick things off on the defense, and once again, same operators will be brought on board. Crescent will yet again bait, but this time with a kite, I suppose. And, um, well, Kids Dorms is going to be the defense choice. IQ as well will be brought on board by Time for Pi, but yeah, there we go, straight away. Six picks to go straight on to that. So, baits were pretty much just about the same, or rather, well, didn't really matter as the six pick was still would have been supposed to be the very same one. But looking at the lineup of the defense yet again, any kind of thoughts on what we might be expecting from Nocturnal here on the kids' bedroom? Well, Nocturnal seems to be going for quite a straightforward setup, you know, they have that mute available, they have the intel from the Valkyrie, they have the standard war denial, so I, I'm not really that surprised to see that coming out from Nocturnal because Nocturnal do play quite safe when it comes to team compositions. I wouldn't be against seeing, you know, maybe a cheeky Caviera being picked, but maybe round one is a little bit too early to start things off. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe too too spicy for round one. Interestingly enough, actually, curious about what was that decision for for the window to be opened up, given that that opens up just a little bit more angles for the attackers to really take, but maybe there's a bigger brain decision behind that. Serenity could be going in for a run downstairs, and that could be a very interesting setup, given that I don't think, or rather, I do not expect Shadownet to drone out down, downstairs, nor I expect them to really think that there will be any presence downstairs, which could be a huge issue. It looks like Serenity is quite close to that kitchen side, that dining side, so it looks like, you know, should an attic push be attempted, Serenity will definitely be that first person that is available to push, and it looks like she's definitely not wasting any time, here. she's pushing straight into kitchen, and after that I would assume she would go straight into green hall, but that is also where Time for Pie was playing, which does mean that Nomad air jabs should be already placed to really deny any form of flank happening. Actually, let us have a look if there are any Nomad charges set up. It doesn't actually look like it. I oh, know, wait, we can hear the the beeping of the Nomad charge, but I'm just a little bit unsure as to where is it particularly. Oh, okay, there's one right at the, at the Watchtower stairs. But nothing is actually there to watch out the kitchen, and Sawyer already got taken down. Well, what I'm assuming is... Um, AJ Tiger, yeah, from up above. That is a huge angle to really play around. And with Serenity now being able to achieve, well, nearly dominant control over the ground floor, she could really find, ooh, Diana's position, but Diana actually completely unaware. Surely Diana would definitely drone out that meeting site. Time for Pi is pushing into that classroom. That res should be happening, but it is going to be in a little bit of a precarious situation because the verticals are still opened up. Mons and Crips are playing in that attic area and they are quite safe at this point because there are claymores and air jabs and you're really preventing Serenity from making any impactful pushes. But that doesn't mean that Serenity can't really still assert her map presence by just flanking straight through that security corridor into classroom. But it will be time for Pi getting that first kill onto Serenity, which makes their life a lot more easier because that's the roam game cut out. Exactly. Yet again, this is a solo um, solo room like we've seen from King's Women whenever we would see Bernabette to go on a play. And now it's a big question as to how long can the um, can the attic be completely held. Seems not for really long. Cribs just decides to go in for a flat out swing right onto the Valkyrie's position. And just like that already. Well, time for Pi just gone down, but only injured. And that does leave all up to Sav and Aussie Princess to really clutch it out because right now in a 3v2 situation, theoretically, in, in the span of 30 se 13 seconds, things that certainly could really get elevated really quickly. There's a swing, peeks out, but oh! Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, Mons able to trade things out at the end. That was an incredibly smooth route coming out from Shadow Day. You know, I will admit I had a little bit of a reservation seeing that their roster wasn't a hundred percent complete, seeing as Minxie isn't playing with them at this point, and they do have a substitute player playing. And a lot of the times when that does happen, you'll see that the team maybe isn't as strong in the first few rounds because they just don't have that existing synergy, or they're still trying to adapt to each other. But I didn't really see any of that. Yeah. It the synergy was certainly there, a little bit of a sloppy beginning for a round, but was very quickly remedied by all of the flank watch and all of the good setups that Shadownet certainly were quite prepared for, whereas on the side of um, Nocturnal certainly looked like they were left a little bit puzzled as to what did they, wa what did they want, what did they need to do, and certainly that ended up biting back at them. So, that said, they shall be retrying kids' dorms and bedroom. As um, it looked as if their setup was all fine, it's just it's more so the gunfights that they've taken and couldn't really solidify. If, for example, if Soy would have been shot down then and there in that study room, that would have been a huge impactful frag because not only that is Sledge with the soft breaches out of the equation, that's the frag grenades gone, that's another fragging operator gone. And that would have definitely forced, I feel, Shadownet to be a little bit more passive about that push about their approach, and uh, that is definitely a huge thing. The moment you're able to thwart, to, uh, to thwart your opponent's um, momentum, it's a huge advantage for, for the defense. 
Yeah, most definitely. And I definitely want to applaud Shadow Net for how they played. They went through things very stock standard and sure there were a few downs on their behalf as well. But ultimately they won all of their gunfights, which is also why they were so successful in closing out that first attacking round. They really didn't lose any members to the Rome game, which was something that we've seen in the past uh, games between Barry's Bees and King's Moon, where the Rome game was incredibly impactful. This time, however, there have been good utilization of gadgets. That air jab is going to be coming out from Time for Pi, which should force Serenity to act a lot slower than what she is ready for. Yeah, Serenity now, she has a perfect position to really play around, but can't really do much there for herself it's aj to also open up onto diana and that is the push through the walking closet completely denied and destroyed as that does leave soy in a very peculiar situation where she can't really well safely pick up the diffuser because um well the hole is open there and well she will be waiting for one of the mistakes to be made by the nocturnal roster given that they're the ones to essentially they, that they need to um, watch out for the uh, diffuser. Yeah, definitely Soy has her work cut out for her at this point. She not only needs to get that diffuser, but also make sure she doesn't die trying to go for it, considering that hard wall is open. Luckily at this point, no one seems to be directly covering that crossfire. So if she were to just run in and really grab it, there wouldn't be a lot of punishment lying in wait for her. As it is, Shadowna is going to be going for more of an uh, attic centered attack, which does mean that for Attackers Soy, she is going to be a bit alone in that bedroom side. Yeah, already, well, another swing does come around. It's Crescent to actually pick up a frag from that boost up spot in the kids' bedroom. With AJ Tiger also taking quite some damage from Time for Pi, this is looking like a little bit more of a dominant round from Nocturnal, given that we are already seeing a 4-2 scoreline. Soy making her entrance in through the breach. We should be able to see the Goyo, but the Goyo sees her much quicker. And now it's all down to the Time for Pi. 39 seconds in a 1v2 is still very workable here. If she's able to nail her shots here onto either Sav or Crescent, this could be a huge advantage here. There's not a lot of intel available in Time for Pi's pocket. She does still have one drone remaining, but it is already placed out on the field, so I don't know how quickly she can utilize it. Between Crescent and Sav, they still have Goyo shields, they still have a lot of health as well, but Time for Pi does have the bomb in her pocket, which does mean she is going to be able to place it down, go for a fake, but it doesn't matter because Sav is going to wide swing and get that headshot onto Time for Pi. And there we go. This time a much bigger difference in the advantage that Nocturnal had there. And managing to even out the scoreline definitely will be putting them back up into the competition. Wouldn't really be allowing Shadownet to get any kind of point advantage at least just yet. And well, we are going to be going down to the laundry room and supply, which is arguably considered one of those uh, one of these um, sites that is pretty that can be pretty well defended. But apart from that, really. Um, can't really do uh, well. We can't, we haven't really seen any any uh, big changes to how usually the push happens. Usually it's a bunker push, then some pressure on the watchtower stairs, and then you kind of push on from there. Yeah, definitely. The most stereotypical push you have is definitely through that bunker, where you need to burn through the variety of gadgets that, they, that the defenders will be placing. Most notably, there will definitely be a, a shield on that elbow site. There will be some, if not all, of Crescent's ADSs being placed on that elbow as well. And there will be at least a few smoke canisters that will also get thrown through if Tiger is able to pull that off. But on Shadownet's side, there is a little bit of an interesting pick as well. Time for Pi has six from that Nomad onto the Monty, which does indicate to me at least more of a bunker push because that is where normally you would see the Monty throw. Normally, when you go into that elbow, you are able to either pressure off whoever is playing on elbow with that Monty, or you can potentially hold that blue door as well to prevent any flinks coming through from the defenders. Looking at AJ's setup, she did try to get a little bit more up close and personal with that doorway, but didn't really able to find, wasn't really able to find any kind of success. Time for Pi now, going for quite an ambitious one. Could be shut down pretty quickly with that gas grenade as well, but in this force to really push up, but oh, right now this is a bit of an issue here because right now 
AJ Tiger is gonna get and keep on being pressured. Another gas grenade could really pretty much solve the deal here as C4 comes around uh, to damage a little bit the the Monty player, but right now AJ will be just forced to fall back. Ooh, he's unshielded. Time for Pi is there. Already off screen, we do also spot a fair few frags that were achieved, and that is the Aussie princes out of the equation. Yeah, definitely. And this is showing us the strength of a Monty player, which is that assertive pressure. Because normally when you retreat from that elbow, you definitely want to reinforce up that wall to prevent the attackers from having more pathways in. But if you have a Monte standing right in that rotate, there's not a lot of opportunity you can get to really go for that reinforcement. And Crips is going to get that kill onto present. Diana and Mima is going to have that bomb being placed. And with that Monte in that rotation in closet, it does mean the defenders are forced into not really being able to rotate back onto the site. Mons is going to get that kill onto Sive and Tiger X finally gets that kill onto Time for Pi, which does mean that they are able to rotate now. Serenity, meanwhile, gets that headshot onto Crips, which does mean that they need to go for a retake. Serenity falls so low trying to push for that bomb, but Mons at the same time takes her pistol, isn't able to clutch out the round for this, and it will just be Dina all by herself. She gets that double kill, gets that triple kill onto Serenity, and Shannon it wins that attacking round. My goodness. Absolutely clip central there for Shannon and Diana doing some phenomenal work there and being able to keep the defense on their toes unable well for and enabling rather more her team to get the score rather than allowing nocturnal to come out with a comeback there in that round so a one point advantage here between the two teams as it's certainly looking like we just might be seeing game of essentially just trading blows between the two rosters and um, definitely a promising start for potentially even an overtime game yeah, potentially, and I think this could be a really strong start to how Shadownet is playing, considering they are, you know, as we've mentioned before, third on the round robin, they do need to beat Nocturnal, and they also Attackers need to beat need Elevate to in order to really cement themselves in that top two position. So to have such a close game straight off the bat against Nocturnal is definitely going to be a good start for them. Yeah, that start is going to be a very crucial one. Momentum is going to be the key thing here for Shadownet to really play off, especially whilst being on their offense. Whereas for Nocturnal, they're looking a little bit borderline lost in some of these um, defenses, how do they want to play around, and uh, for Shadownet, this is working out perfectly for them. They're able to just go for those really ballsy uh, pushes, namely Time for Pi, who just completely denied and kind of left Poor AJ Tiger is at the kind of uh, <laughs> absolutely kind of stunned um, position where she couldn't really decide whether she wants to use up another gas grenade. D does she want to um, keep on trying to get a gunfight with Time for Pi? And neither of these things really worked out until later notice. Yeah, especially with the onset of the Monty nerf, where, you know, once you get knifed, your sensitivity and your ability to really recover from that is going to be a lot lacking. This time, a lot more instant pressure does come out onto Time for Pi. There is going to be a cross angle that is going to be held in that blue bunker. One on that blue bunker door and one on that elbow, which does mean that Shadow Knight won't get as, uh, as much of a free push as they did before. But Typho Pi is taking this a little bit slower. She still is managing to get onto site. Does spot out all the utility that is going to be going in. Takes a little bit of damage to the smoke canister. And this time, it is going to be Aussie Princess in a very tough position facing off against her. Yeah, once again, it is the Valkyrie player that is having a few issues. And finally, well, there's a down coming around. But at a very hard price as well. Gotta say, Time for Pi definitely took quite some damage. So a few more ticks of the gas grenade could be pretty much seeing the end of it. Another peak, another swing could be coming around. And oh, Diana taking a little bit of a damage. Chris finding some trade off. So that's already good. But so much damage has been already dealt to the multiplayer of Shadow Net. But oh, that is a good bait. That is an excellent bait for Crips to find himself a headshot. Yeah, and Time for Pi is so low as the Monty Shield, but it doesn't matter because you are able to create all that opportunity for your team and all those cross angles because just having a shield in your face is an incredible amount of pressure that Shadownet are taking advantage of. Because at this point, this attacker side looks so strongly in favor of Shadownet. Most definitely, and 
the sheer coordination that we are seeing from Shadownet is absolutely amazing. No whatsoever uh, contestion from um, from Nocturnal is certainly a bit of an alarming thing for them, given that they already have a two-round disadvantage, and now having to reside to the kitchen dining defense, which is usually considered as a tertiary one, is definitely one of those things that uh, it's definitely a little bit um, questioning their confidence, maybe. It's actually really interesting to not see that Monty six pick come out from Time for Pie once more because it seems to almost indicate that they have an idea that after you know losing two times to a Monty player in that down in that basement site, it seems like they know that Nocturnal won't be going there again, which does mean that they have no need to go on a Monty this time. Instead, having a nomad, you know, once again denying any form of roam is just going to be a lot more impactful. So it really shows that Shadownet have done their, you know, possibly their research onto Nocturnal and how they play and they really formed ways to counteract against that. Yeah, and that is actually the storyline for both of the rosters for Shadownet, for their LPL Pro roster as well as the Women's League roster, uh, where um, both of the rosters have seen quite a fair bit of uh, phenomenal adaptation coming out from them, from game to game basis, from round to round basis. And certainly here it is just yet another testament to the fact that Shannon and I certainly have been putting in quite some time in their preparations, in their maybe even VOD reviewing uh, for some of their games and being able to just scrim it as much as possible. Yeah, and you definitely see that being showed off because at this point it doesn't feel like Shadownet is phased at all versing up against Nocturnal when we have seen various other teams who have versed Nocturnal and really not had have the same amount of momentum, especially on attack at this. Yeah, that's that's probably the biggest um, interesting point is the fact that it, it's all being done on attack. The side that is usually being not really favoured with a uh, women's league, it's usually the defense where the majority of the point, uh, points is being achieved, but it seems that here, right now, Shadownet are able to really bring it to Nocturnal, whereas Nocturnal just seeming to be trying to adjust on the go, but it's very much of a very stiff learning curve, or rather, very, very um, large learning curve. Here, I'm a little bit curious to see what Shadow Knight's point of attack is. They are going for a very strong attic push, when at this point they could possibly be you know, deviating off. They could also be opening that walk-in closet, maybe to force Serenity out of her position, because where Soy is holding right now, there's not a lot of pressure that she can really assert on the defenders. Crips is going to be going for an alternate angle, but it's not soon enough because Serenity is going to wide swing, get that kill onto Soy. Staff getting that second kill onto Crips does mean that that cross angle that they were trying to set up isn't going to be utilized as effectively. Interestingly enough, it is actually Mons that is attempting to drone ahead for Diana, as already the traces will be there to indicate the position of the Jaeger, but already the damage has been dealt. It is a 2v3 situation, and Maybe this time we'll, we'll be seeing the tunnel actually slow down the, uh, the round bleed that has been currently achieved by Shadownet. They have quite a fair few angles already locked down and AJ Tiger is oh, potentially able to deal quite a fair bit of damage but unfortunately neither of those shotgun shells actually land anywhere. Yeah, facing up against a shotgun, especially in those close quarters, is definitely not something you want to be going for. Mons does have still a drone in her pocket. She is able to drone out the site. They should be able to go for some form of attack from those kids from that kid's hatch, but they are going to be going for a white stairs push. They do need to be really careful about this because Aussie Princess is still sitting there, very, very aware that a push will be happening. But no, instead actually it's just a complete double kill here between Diana and Mons, and it's all down to AJ to actually try to make the clutch here going. Diana also going in for a swing. Could be finding Mons, actually downs Mons, but Attackers now the diffuser will be stuck. The Attackers pings are actually coming out. Diana needs to go in for a swing, has full HP, goes in for the ping, whips out the pistol, needs to really connect those shots and actually able to clutch it out. What a play. And what a huge round this is for Shadow Knight. You know, things looked a little bit rough when they were going for that roam clear and they didn't trade it as well as you would hope it to go. But 
Ultimately, between Diana and Mons, they were able to really clean up that round, even get that bomb down, and get that final kill as well. Exactly, well, this is a very interesting outcome. Personally, for me, I was still expecting a little bit more dominance from Nocturnal, but it seems like that is through and through um, a game for Shadow Knight to win, it seems, given that they are looking so much more prepared comparative to their opponents here. Yeah, it definitely looks like Nocturnal is in a little bit of a tough spot, which is quite rare to see them in. You know, the only other time that we ever seen them forced into a corner like this was when they were versing Elevate, which does make me question a little bit. At this rate that Shadow Knight is improving, they could potentially be a great challenger for Elevate as well. Yeah, Elevate is almost like, at this point, like the main boss of the whole... <laughs> The of the whole boss. league, the final boss, yeah. <laughs> First they have an external as kind of the, uh, what feels like the main boss, but really is just the first phase, and then you, just, you get Elevate that is just like the ultimate form of uh, the final contender, which is um, yet to be, I suppose, contested. If Shadow Knight will be able to keep themselves in the top four, they actually will get another chance to really play against um, Elevate. And uh, if they are able to bring in that kind of aggression, that kind of play, like they're doing right now against the tunnel, um, I definitely f think that Elevate could be definitely um, be contested in a very dominant manner as well. Yeah, most definitely, because something that we have seen coming out from Shadow Knight is their strong game, uh, is their strong gunplay as well. At this rate, you know, between the top three teams of Nocturnal, Shadow Knight, and Elevate. They all seem to have quite capable strategies already pre-planned, whether they are on attack or defense. So at this point, it just does come down to coordination, communication, as well as just how well can you hit your shots, which definitely at this rate, Shadow Knight is showing that they can do all three. Oh yeah, 100%. Now in the final round of their attack, they are going to be pushing Kid's bedroom. So last time they had to attack it, first push was worn out by them and then the second one was completely thwarted by Nocturnal so a bit of a 50-50 coin toss I suppose this will be very much dependent on how quickly they will be able to eliminate Crescent uh, from her position in the attic as well as that if AJ Tiger will be taken out here fairly quickly or rather will be denied her position. The attic wall does get opened up by Crips, you know, no real problem there. I believe it was Mons going in for that soft breach in charge that managed to really seal the deal. Flash grenades does come out from time for high, which does mean that the ADSs are going to be opened up, and it does mean that quick rotation can be called in order for that master bedroom take as well. Yeah, well, the breach is going to be successful. It's AJ Tiger trying to throw out the, well, not actually, it won't be throwing out the C4. But rather, we'll be playing at a bit of an unpredictable angle, I suppose. Diana, hoping to drone out and maybe get a get some sort of information, does actually spot AJ Tiger. We'll be forcing the mute player to really fall back as she's unable to really hit the drone, and actually will be forced off her position. So this is a huge play here. Soy already also rotated over to the master bedroom, so this is where it seems like quite a fair bit of pressure is going to be applied. One breaching charge does come out from Soy, which potentially should take down that Malusi uh, gadget. Attic control has already been obtained. No, I believe that Malusi was not taken down. But Attic control has been obtained, and Mons is going for a rotate, I believe, onto those bunks. Tiger attack. does seem a little bit pressured at this point. There is a multitude of angles that she needs to cover. But once again, that present bomb. from You're that teddy bear vaulting up is going to get that kill onto Crypt. Mons is going to get it down, but she isn't going to quite be able to finish that off. Meanwhile, Typho Pie is downed outside those double doors. Soy finishes off that down onto Sav, but the timer is still ticking down, and she needs to get that kill onto Tiger. She gets it, but gets quick, quickly taken down, and it is just Mons now. Mons goes in for a repel into the site, but it will be Crescent finishing off Mons, and meanwhile, Typho Pie will, will die to just being downed outside. Yep. Well, that does leave us in a 4-2 scoreline. It's still a pretty solid setup for Shadow Knight, given that they now ensure themselves at least two more rounds of, essentially, um, uh, for some of the mistakes to be, uh, or rather some of the funkier strats to be attempted. And uh, Kids Dorms is going to be, yet again, the site to be defended, but this time it is going to be coming out from um, Shadow Knight. Looking at their lineup, nothing really much has changed. 
apart from the fact that we are now seeing both of the SAS Defender Operators to come around and Crips actually swapping off from Goyo, I'm not actually too sure what, if it's going to be Goyo to Goyo because she, yeah, she looks very much confused as to where do they want to, where does she want to, um, bombs. switch over to. I mean, Goyo is never going to be a bad choice for this site. Having those flaming shields is always going to be incredibly strong, especially if you want to deny the attackers from freely pushing into attic. You can place just a Goyo shield on that walkway. You can you know, burst it real quick when that attic control is almost about to be lost. Occasionally, instead of a Goyo, you can see a Valkyrie as well because they both have quite similar setups. They do have shields, they both have C4s, and they both have quite capable 2-2 speeds as well. Ten seconds to go. Yeah, although I do think that probably uh, the fact that Attackers there won't be any Valkyrie will be definitely limiting some of the quote-unquote view range of Shadowman that they could achieve, but most definitely with their utility they could certainly slow things down whenever the action will um, will come around to um, either the attic or the actual site. And by then, this is where kind of Shadowman will be really playing for their raw skill, their, their gunfight potential. Yeah, it'll be good to see Shadow Knight, you know, putting that aggression that they showed us on attack onto defense because as as an aggressive team to be on the defense and to be able to roam and really capitalize on any form of information that you can get, it's always going to be an intimidating task. And at this point, Nocturnal is aware that Shadow Knight could be going for a flank. They are covering any form of doorways, any form of potentially flanks. So Shadownet need to be incredibly careful as to how they position. Funnily enough, Shadownet are actually not even bothering to really go for a very extended roam like Nocturnal tried to pull off. Instead, they are actually just sitting around just below the site to maybe see if they can prevent some of the plants uh, from below rather than uh, going for some extended um, roams. Funnily enough, actually the breaches are starting to actually happen, and that is both in the attic and the walking closet, and that is quite a wide position as well opened up. So quite a wide angle for Crescent to really contest, same goes for Sav. And right now this is just a bit of a calm before the storm, not a single shot has been really exchanged between some of the teams, and instead it's just a whole lot of droning that is actually being conducted here by Nocturnal. Yeah, at this point, you know, the safe thing to go for is to just really get as much intel as you can to the layout of how the defenders are playing and to really see if they can identify a weak spot or some place that you can capitalize on where the defenders aren't really expecting it. Yeah, meanwhile, defenders pretty much set up in fairly passive positions. Cripps is about to be in a whole lot of trouble because right now her shield got popped. She's currently overexposing herself right to that doorway, so the moment there could have been a swing that could be huge and really just a, maybe a, a suggestion to fall back will be probably a pretty good decision here. Already a frag by time for Pi will be opening up, same goes for Crips actually being able to open up onto Serenity. And that is already a 3v5 and potentially, well, 3v2, that is a phenomenal flick there, I gotta say. Yeah, and that's added control instantly handed back into Shadow Knight, which does mean that Nocturnal is going to be a little bit more pressured as to where they really Attackers want to be taking that bomb. push. The diffuser has been dropped right outside of the walk-in. I'm not sure if Shadow Knight are aware of this, uh, it, but it does mean that Nocturnal need to rotate quickly to retake control remain. of that. But all these cross angles have already been identified Ten by Shadow Knight. That big window is being double covered up by two shotguns, one from the side, Ten one from below. Stab is going to get that kill onto Crips, but it doesn't matter because Time for Pi is going to get that final kill. Once again, a stunning performance here from, from Shadow Knight, being able to lock things down and once again being able to just win out, win out straight through just the eliminations and through all the kills rather than even allowing to get the plan down to um, pretty much allow even even basic entry to even remotely close by areas is certainly quite a stunning performance. Now going into the laundry supply room, this is going to be where I feel going to be the, the breaking point, I suppose, where um, Shadow Knight will get a chance to really give themselves that match point, but also a chance for um, for Nocturnal to break that momentum. Yeah, if any time 
was a time to break that momentum, now is definitely when they should be going for it. Especially on that Defenders bunker side where Shadow Knight really showed how strong they were because that was where the majority of the rounds that they won came from. It actually came from, you know, having that Montaigne, that aggressive push that it really felt like Nocturnal didn't really know how to react to it. They seen the shield and they were incredibly intimidated by that shield, but they couldn't really counteract against any of that. No, no, no. Shadow Knight. Gonna be looking <laughs> at uh, potentially holding a little bit more aggressively, maybe with those Goyer shields. And. Maybe, maybe they shall be able to play it up a little bit up close and personal. Well, already this lead set up that this whole hallway of the bunker <laughs> does show us. Um, Dan is intending to really hold on for quite a while before being forced out of that position. Whereas I'm kind of curious that we're not really seeing a whole lot of Goyo positions, um, or rather Goyo shields to be established around bunker, and rather instead it's used for more so just holding the doorways and the pillar side of um, um, of the downstairs basement. It's actually really interesting to see the pillars being opened up because as I recall, Nocturnal didn't go for that route, which did mean that when a hard bunker push was forced from Shadownet, there wasn't a lot of available cross angles that Nocturnal could go for. Whereas, Shadow Knight opening up that pillar wall, having a deployable shield there as well to really cover their bodies when they're standing there, it does mean that the job of Diana will be a little bit easier because she does have a few angles that she should be able to almost be covered from by her teammates. Yeah. Diana will be definitely hoping that Crips will be there to really cover her whenever there's going to be a wide swing. But right now, oh my, that is a little bit of a... Borderline threading the needle, Soy being pressured there at that pillar is certainly not the best case scenario and oh, decides to turn around, will be exposing the cheeks directly there, but Crips is uh, there to really get the revenge on the fallen teammate and will be returning back to her position right now, Diana is getting pressured quite substantially and will be able to actually return back to the side and reinforce, so very good map knowledge will be resulting in a very prompt fallback from her. Yeah, and she had that confidence to move because she knew that Crips was covering her flank almost. Oh, and Typho oh. Pi is going to go for a little bit of a cheeky swing from that electrical closet. Doesn't manage to cut quite get anyone. And those electrical walls will get opened up to that ace charge. But look at the time. That has been two minutes that have been drained from the clock. And still, Nocturnal don't really have their flank watch set up, which means that if Shadow Net goes for a more aggressive swing, they could manage to get a cheeky kill off. Most definitely. Now, Diana actually managed to fall back all the way to the freezer, which she'll be locked out of at this point, but she surely has a shotgun, so should be able to make a rotation hole here, so not an, uh, a non-issue at all. Time for Pi actually goes in for a swing, decides to go in for yet another one, but unfortunately will be punished straight off the bat, but still dishes out quite some damage to Crescent. 3v2 situation now that Serenity was able to find an opening on side, and the and diffusely it will be start to get planted. Serenity finding herself a 2k, now all down to Mons to get the clutch going. In a 1v3 situation, things could be done here, but certainly not looking all too well because right now all three of the Nocturnal players are pretty healthy. And this is a downside of not really being able to pick a Maestro or a Valkyrie or any form of intel because now Mons has to go in blind and she doesn't get that kill off to Crescent, rather it's Crescent who gets that kill off onto Mons and there will be a round that is handed over to Nocturnal. There we go. Finally Nocturnal do break that streak that currently Shadownet had. And, uh, well, we shall be seeing yet another attempt at the laundry supply room. Given that kids' dorms has not yet unlocked, or rather, won't be, uh, well, yeah, haven't yet been unlocked. So, um, another attempt at the laundry defense is definitely not going to be a bad decision, given that it was still a pretty well defended, um, round until the last, say, 30 seconds, where... The whole of Shadow Knight roster got pretty much wiped out the moment Serenity decided to go for a very aggressive push. Now, and <laughs> last moment attempt um, for a 6 pick is going to be there. And 
we shall be seeing a slight change around. Time for Pi actually bringing in the Legion rather than the Mute. So the only player that will be, or rather the only operator that will be able to deny some breach, some maybe even drones if uh, they're able to electrify the barbed wire is going to be tired. Yeah, and really Kai is all you need. Seeing as Thatcher is banned, it does just mean that Kai can throw uh, her, his, her, yeah. <laughs> uh, electrify claws onto the hatches, and there shouldn't really be much counterplay behind it. And to have those hatches being reinforced and really safe from any form of breaching will give Shadowman a little bit more leeway of how to play. Ideally, though, if they do stick to how they were set up in the previous round, there shouldn't be a lot of concern because, you know, as you said, Shadow Net were doing quite spectacularly until the last few seconds. Reloading. That meeting we'll hatch to... is going to be soft for a while. I do see Soy running up desperately uh -oh. to go reinforce that. Hopefully, uh, you know, Nocturnal isn't moving too fast to be able to get that swing onto her. I am a little bit concerned to see how Soy is going to make it back onto site, but. It doesn't matter because AJ Tigerx is going to be taking a hefty amount of damage going for that bunker push. Yeah, completely shut down. It's definitely a good beginning here. Already Soy, funnily enough, decides to actually stay around the meeting room, which I don't think was actually pushed at all. And Time for Pi is actually going to be playing a much more aggressive angle here on the main staircase as they are now expecting a full-blown actual aggression to come out there. Serenity, pushing up on a very aggressive angle, could actually find herself a very early frags, but instead we'll be opting into starting to open up the wall here, which could be big, but again, could be also shot through at that head level. Yeah, definitely. You want to be careful when you're opening up those maverick holes because you could be opening yourself up to cross angles that definitely don't work in your advantage. But, speaking of advantage, Shadow Knight definitely still has this because Sav and Tiger X are incredibly low. Time for Pi goes for that head height peak, doesn't quite get that kill. Takes a little bit of damage in compensation for that, but things are still looking good for Shadow Knight. Most definitely. AJ Tiger now had already pre air jabbed her previous position, but look at all these health points. For Serenity, it's just about 1 HP. For Sav, it's just about 25. AJ Tiger is pretty low, so all of them being softened up is a good thing here. But right now, Shadow Net will definitely need to nail their gunfights because this could be a crucial change around, given that, well, Soy and uh, Crips were just forced out of their, out of their flank the moment they realized that it's air jab. Doesn't matter though. Crips goes for a blind fire through that smoke, manages to get that kill onto Crescent. She is taking a lot of damage peeking out from that freezer, and Sav is going to get a double kill onto Diana. Crips finally gets that double kill onto Sav, and Soy is going for a flank back down those tower stairs. If she does swing at this point, she needs to be careful of Tigrex because Tigrex has her sights trained directly where Soy's head is going to be poking out from. Oh, now that is a huge change here. All of a sudden, the healthiest operator has dropped the diffuser bang on in the middle of the site, and right now the main option here is for the attack to start recovering that diffuser. Serenity has her sights trained, but oh, straight away Crips finds the kill. Will be traded out though, it's a 1v2. Soy just about to go on a flank right now, but Mons is the one to close out the round. It is the match point for Shadownet. Yeah, Shadow Net really held that site incredibly strong, and it looks like they adapted from the mistakes that they made in that previous round, which was going for those wide swings, you know, going for kills that they possibly shouldn't have really pushed for. Instead, this time Shadow Net played it a lot more conservative, they were a lot safer with how they roamed and how they reacted, and it definitely paid off to their advantage. Exactly, well, just like that, it is yet another win for them, only one round away from full-blown victory against the um, Nocturnal, who currently are at the top of the leaderboard, I believe, if, well, possibly could have been dethroned just yet now by Elevate because of that 7-1, but nonetheless, this is going to be a huge upset given that previously not a single team apart from Elevate were able to really play in a very dominant game against Nocturnal, so this is a huge change-up and a huge shake-up already um, within the competitive scene and for the image of the Nocturnal as well. Yeah, and for Shadownet to be able to go back onto that bedroom site is going to be just another small advantage to them because they have managed to defend it quite successfully. So as long as they repeat the performance they did before, they should be going straight into a, a map win. 
but we'll have to see because it's still a few more rounds remaining and Nocturnal could very much still pull off a very quick comeback. Only three rounds differential here, but the main issue is that mental pressure that will be applied onto Nocturnal, given that um, they are pretty much now um, on the final chance, really. They can't make any more mistakes, they can't lose any more rounds. And in the current situation, well, while they were able to run away with a few rounds here and there, most of them were to just break the overall pace that was set up against them. Yeah, a very similar lineup coming out from Chardonnay, you know, round after round. It seems like this is the lineup that they do prefer, and it does feel like they are quite comfortable with it and quite comfortable with how their setup works. So to have that being faced off against Nocturnal, who, you know, haven't really been pressured this entire time, to see them getting forced into a corner and to really see Nocturnal try out every single strategy available to them is definitely going to be a little bit of an eye-opener as to Chardonnay's strength. It's curious to me how Sav is just still playing outside the the building, really, waiting for a spawn peak. But it seems that Soy is completely reluctant to that, not even bothering really to do that. And instead, that actually borderline passively drains all that time, which is very crucial here for Nocturnal. Already losing out a minute um, and still ticking is a huge thing. The breaches are going to be starting though, so that is already. A good thing here for Nocturnal, as their their first opening is there. So one of the avenues for the push are certainly opened up. But Crips, Crips is still there. Crips is still ready for a push because right now so much utility is being drained, and right now Nocturnal will be hoping that it's only a singular ADS. But very quickly finding out about that. Oh boy. Crips does still have a C4 in her pocket, but she isn't able to react in time, and her own shield will be dealing a bulk of damage towards her. It does, however, mean that Nocturnal can't really quickly push down that attic landing, is that they have to wait for those flames to subside. Aussie Princess is going to be going for a rotate onto that big window, which should force a little bit of a cross angle out from Nocturnal, but Typhoid Pie is there waiting to respond to this as well. Yeah, right now, Time for Pirate will be notified of that presence and will be sending out a few more warning shots before any further gunfights. As right now, it's a bit of a stalling moment, really. Nocturnal were, really, were able to claim finally the control over over the attic, but right now, Mons is still wa uh, watching over, well, watched over that crosswalk. And right now, Serenity could actually deal quite some damage as AJ Tigers that will get taken down. Crescent is going to get that kill onto Soy, but Mons with a double kill is going to quickly refrag onto Serenity. And there's only 20 seconds left on the clock. Ozzy does still have that double window control, which cuts a lot of line of sight off, but Sav can't really make it onto site with those smoke canisters coming in. Time for Pi gets that kill onto Ozzy Princess. Mons with a triple kill onto Crescent, and Sav just by herself needs to get those three final kills in that one second. Otherwise, it is just going to be a GG over to Shadownet, and Shadownet will be taking out Oregon as their win. An absolutely stunning performance really, able to run down the time, win out this map and pretty much perform a one of the largest upsets right now in the season 3 as currently this will be giving Nocturnal a very large L, a 7-3 win and please get out of my face here <laughs> analyst, um, but a 7-3 win. That is a, such a huge victory here for Shadownet, and them being able to secure that, that should be um, able to propel them pretty high on a leaderboard as well, and maybe even contest against a um, team like Elevate. Yeah, I, I believe after this win today, that should push them straight into that second place position, whereas for Nocturnal, it should put them down slightly, seeing as Elevate haven't really lost a game so far, I believe Elevate should rise to the first place, but uh, we'll That's take a look at yeah. the rankings later and we'll definitely confirm that for sure. But as it is, you know, Shadow Knight really showed us just how incredible they are. We really didn't <laughs> expect something to come out of this, you know, straight from the start. A team like Nocturnal is almost comparable to a team like Elevate, and, you know, they're like the two giants of this round robin at this point. So to have an almost unknown challenger appear out of nowhere to really <laughs> put a thorn into Nocturnal's side is such a huge event. 
It is, yeah, it is certainly amazing to see such kind of upsets to happen. Maybe for Nocturnal, this just wasn't their day. Maybe it was just Shadownet just being absolutely nuts. Maybe it's just a mixture of a little bit of both because, look, big props to Shadownet. Unfortunate loss, though, for Nocturnal. So definitely this will be mixing up and doing quite a shake-up to the leaderboard. But let's get a quick refresher as well onto what score lines we have witnessed tonight as well as that we, or what we... Um, seen off stream as well. So, for the to kick things off tonight, it was Kings Women versus Barry's Bees in a very um, close game. I'm gonna say seven four was the final score line into the favor of Kings Women. Seven one to Elevate as well against the Musketeers as uh, Elevate continue their flawless run. And match three it was Nocturnal versus Shannon that just wrapped up a seven three win for Shannonet with them having actually I believe. Yeah, three, three round streak, and then a two round streak at the end to close it all out. So, mad props to Shadownet once again. This is going to be one of the uh, biggest wins that they've had so far in the women's league, and definitely keen to see how will the last week um, of the round robin will shape up. Yeah, and I think comparatively, you know, today's games that have been streamed have been a lot closer than the past games that have been streamed, you know, to have not just almost a one-sided 7-0 or a 7-1 occur is always going to be a great achievement, you know, to see two teams that obviously have a lot of potential and a lot of synergy already within them, to see them face off against other equally capable teams is always going to be such a fun match to watch. Yes, most definitely. I'm quite keen to see how that will really wrap up because um yeah shadow versus elevate is going to be quite a huge one just after they just dethroned nocturnal as kind of the the vice um leader of the of the board here i suppose um up next is elevate the kind of the the final boss uh for shadow to really try to surpass whereas for 71st this is going to be their chance to uh, keep themselves alive in the on the leaderboard with uh, their match against Barry's Bees. And for Musketeers, it is going to be against King's Women. And this is going to be the big shakeup at the bottom of the leaderboard to see who will be um, left at the bottom of the leaderboard, who will be uh, left kind of in the middle of that and to get out of the potential uh, relegations should there be any. But let's have a look at the final standings here for tonight and um, see where we ended up landing. Yeah, and as we can take a look, we can see that Shadow Knight have definitely risen up the ranks prior to today. They were actually thirds, but after their win against Nocturnal, there has been a little bit of a reshuffling of the top three teams. And it is going to be Elevate in that first position with no losses under their belt. But closely following behind, it's also going to be Shadow Knight with no losses under their belt. Which means that as for saying Cthulhu, next week when we do get to see Elevate face off against Shadow Knight, there will be a team that will walk away with a loss and we will have a very decisive victor after these round robins. Most definitely. And that will also possibly decide the final seeding as well for the whenever the playoffs um, happen. So it's definitely going to be a very saucy set of games that we are going to be seeing um, next week. But look, I'm, I'm very keen, especially after tonight's performance by Shannon, that I'm even more hyped really for uh for the next week and look, that is just all all aligning to be a very exciting end of the season yeah most definitely and and you know you really want to be saving those best games to be in in the last few games that you watch so you know make sure you stick around make sure you stay tuned because the next few games are definitely going to be ones that you don't want to miss miss <laughs> most definitely well now will be it from us as well, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming around. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pi, as well, for joining me for a, a, an amazing set of games that we've seen, an amazing close games as well. And um, look, also massive thanks to our wonderful sponsors, that is Ubisoft ANZ, ZQ Racing, Computer Alliance, Intel, Cooler Master, as well as Asus ROG. And on behalf of myself, Pi, and all the admin team and production team at XP Esports, we wish you a good night, stay safe, and see you next week.
I think that you should come back home. See